Hello, my name's Greg Villalobos. I've done about 4,000, 4,500 miles on my AJP PR7 now. Uh, so it's time for a little bit of an update. Okay, welcome. So if you are interested in the PR7 and you haven't seen any of my other films, go hunt them out. Uh, follow the links in the description. There's quite a few um, from me getting this bike new actually delivered to my door in a crate and unboxing it and building it, which was quite good fun, uh, especially during lockdown, um, right through to first service and some of the first mods. So uh, I have done now, I think about four and a half thousand miles on it. Um, I've just done a trip, a Trans-Euro Trail trip through Wales here in the UK. Go watch the film if you haven't. Um, and there's a lot of supplementary films about the gear used in that. Um, and I just thought it'd be worth kind of giving a little bit of an update about kind of where I'm at that, with that bike. Um, some of the kind of honeymoon romance has kind of rubbed off, um, or worn off, I should say. Uh, I still love the bike. Let's just get that out first. But uh, I, I am a bit more aware of some of the kind of, uh, the less than perfect bits of the bike. Anyway, here we go. So. I guess the first thing to say is what is broken on the bike? So I ride my bikes pretty hard, a couple of reasons. Uh, well, I don't race them, so I'm not riding them as in I'm not kind of like wringing their neck. So they get an easy life with me from that respect, but I do fall off my bike a lot. <laughs> um, I'm not the best rider in the world, but I'm more than happy to take it on challenging terrain. Um, I'm also pretty short, so I very often don't get my foot down and so the bike comes down and that's just kind of normal bike ownership for me. Um, short rider, tall bike, it's going to happen. Um, so I have broken a few things. Some of those things have been my fault and some things have not been my fault. Um, let's go through, I've made a little list here. So the Speedo, the Speedo sensor failed uh, about, I don't know, 3,000 miles, something like that, um, around the service time. Um, I've had that fail on my KTM EXC before. It's a really, really simple fix. I contacted AJP and they replaced that on warranty. And the one that I've fitted uh, has been absolutely fine. It's like a 10 minute job to replace. It's dead easy. Um, the tablet, I've covered this in previous films. The tablet failed. Um, it wasn't waterproof and it got wet. Um, so I've replaced that with the Garmin Montana 700i. Um, the fuel cap didn't fail, but it's really sticky um, and was a real pain to get on and off. So I replaced that with the Zip Tie Racing fuel cap, uh, 3D Moto Do One, and I opted for the, the Zip Tie one just because it's got a, a lower profile. It actually still sticks up quite a bit, um, but it is lower profile. It doesn't have a breather hose. So far, that has not been a problem for me. You can feel there's a little bit of a vacuum of pressure when you unscrew it, when you've kind of emptied the tank, but it's it's not caused any fueling problems or anything like that, so it's been fine. Um, the clutch plates I've replaced, that was my fault. Uh, I was riding it like my EXC up a very, very difficult um, ascent, uh, and they didn't burn out. I still managed to get up and over, and the bike still ran fine to an extent. It was just that the clutch had become a little bit jerky, um, before the oil had warmed up in the morning. So I opted to replace those. It was a fairly straightforward job. I did it myself. I didn't have to take it in. Um, and since I've replaced those and not ridden it like a dick, <laughs> it's been totally fine. Um, the exhaust, so I have got a standard exhaust. Uh, I haven't got the Doma power-up kit. Um, I personally, I don't feel that that bike needs more power. Um, what it needs and what I want is more slow speed control. I'm not really bothered about kind of blasting it through, you know, the sand dunes or whatever. Um, so the exhaust silencer itself is fine. It's not too loud. I actually quite like it. Um, but the uh, the header pipe is like, it's, it's made of cheese. Um, so yeah, it gets dense um, in terms of the location of where it runs along the bottom. I'm not actually bothered about that at all. I don't really think that affects the performance, but it's rusted so badly. Um, so 
I don't know, I, I, I'm going to see what I can do because I don't really want to have to go to the expense of a full power-up kit that I don't want just to get a better um, header pipe. So I'm going to see if I can either um, source one from AJP or maybe get one made that's a higher quality um, stainless steel maybe, I don't know, whatever. whatever. The, the exhaust pipe on my, um, on my EXC uh, it doesn't look new, but it doesn't look nearly as bad as this, uh, and that's much, much older. So yeah, um, expect your header pipes to just go, <laughs> basically. Um, what else is broken? Uh, nothing really. Uh, I did have a little mishap doing uh, an over-egged wheelie, uh, and I snapped off the... Uh, basically, I was doing a real low-speed wheelie, uh, about five miles an hour. Um, and someone, a friend, was taking photos, and I just overcooked it, and I flipped the bike, um, and it went down on its side, and I snapped the uh, foot peg off, which was, I thought that was going to be an absolute disaster. But it turns out that, unlike some other enduro bikes, the foot peg is bolted on and not welded on. So, in fact, it was a really, really easy thing to replace. Uh, I approached, uh, I, I got hold of a new one through AJP, they sent me a new one, and I just literally, it was just like a unscrew and screw back in, dead easy. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think other than that, over the last four and a half thousand miles, nothing else is broken. Um, I've had no issues with fueling problems. I'm still on the completely stock standard ECU. Um, I've not done any of the remapping or any of the upgrades on that. Um, I put in a, I haven't done the Google Tech fuel filter. All I did was I put a, a higher quality um, inline fuel filter. Um, so I just replaced the stock, is it HK1 or something like that, with um, uh, a higher quality one. Um, but I haven't done the full thing going into the neck of the, you know, where you have to get the pump out and all that. I haven't done any of that. Um, so fueling so far has been totally fine, no problems. Um, Mm, it's in the winter it's a little hard to start um, and people got a few tips and techniques where you kind of turn the ignition you prime it you leave it a minute and then you hit the button um, so when it's cold uh, it's a Portuguese bike that feels like it's been made for Portuguese summer if it's warm not a problem if it's cold it can be a little bit of a pain to start but it's never not started um, so yeah, uh, I hear through the grapevine and through the forums and stuff that the 2021 model, which has got a new ECU in it, um, does start a lot better. Um, but again, I've not had any problems so far with mine, so touch wood, everything's looked fine there. Um, other than that, no, totally fine. I, um, I put some new lights on it because the lights are not particularly great and if I had a bit of money I would have changed the actual light unit but I didn't so I just put like this some side uh, lights on and made a little bracket because I already had these lights and I wired them in to the high beam so yeah that's fine I think I've got another little film about that if you want to go look for it. Um, servicing uh, I did the first service at MHB with Martin. So that's the UK importer now of uh, AJP. He's based in Kirkby, Kirby Stephen up in um, uh, the north of England. It's in it's it West Yorkshire, North Yorkshire. Anyway, uh, it's about 50 miles away from, from me. Um, and you get a great service there. He knows that SWM engine inside out. I actually dropped in there the other day on the way home and he had a couple of PR7s on the ramp doing a bit of work on them and yeah, great guys there, so definitely check them out. Um, the Most of the servicing I've done myself, um, so it's really the basic servicing is just your oils and filters. What I haven't done is I haven't checked the valves. Um, it's starting fine. I think probably I will do a valve check um, at the next one. Um, I might take it into MHB to do that because um, I'm not hugely confident adjusting the valves myself. But again, I don't think it's actually that complicated. Um, but all the other stuff I've done myself. Um, on the trip that I just went on, um, it was probably about six or 700 miles that I put on the bike once you include the motorway miles. Uh, I changed the oil before I left um, and actually it was really hot while we were riding in Wales. The fan was 
going over time and I hate it when the bike fan is going because you just like you know the bike is working hard but it, you know if you're riding in Portugal and it's hot that fan must just be on all the time um, but uh, for peace of mind and because we did ride some harder lanes um, I changed the oil when I got back so uh, I mean the oil when I dropped it out it definitely didn't look new <laughs> it wasn't uh, golden or, or red anymore um, so I kind of feel that for the sake of 20 quid's worth of oil and a bit of time it's fairly low cost regular maintenance uh, to just change the oil it's the, it's the I feel like it's the kindest thing I can do to that bike um, if I'm going to ride it um, in more challenging terrain um, the motors tires I've got motors Raul Z's on that um, so the, that I put, put some fresh ones on before this trip the Rouseys are a fantastic, fantastic bike, uh, uh, fantastic tyre for bikes like this, 690, that kind of thing. Um, they don't last that long, that's the only thing. So the previous set that I took out, um, the rear wasn't anywhere near bald, it wasn't shot, but it was well on its way and that had had about 3,000 miles. The front probably had, an, I could have left the front on, but I did change them both. Um, if you're just doing dirt riding, I think they'll last a lot longer and they are pretty grippy for a bike of that size. Um, but if you're, I mean, you know, if you're doing road stuff as well, then just be, they're a good tyre, but just be prepared for them to not last mega, mega, mega miles. Um, they're also quite noisy, but then it's a single cylinder bike. It's not exactly a silent bike when you're riding down the road anyway. Um, but yeah, I... I don't really feel the need to change those. If I did, I'd maybe think about the Motors Tractionator Adventure, which I did run on my old CB500X, which got mega, mega mileage out of those, but were nowhere near as um, grippy in the dirt. Um, luggage, so I've made films about the um, luggage setup I have on this bike. The last trip that I did was a similar setup to my previous ones. If you want to find out more about that, just follow the links, um, they'll take you there. Um, what else, what else to talk about the bike? So one of the significant things that happened on this trip was I semi-drowned the bike, not fully drowned the bike, I semi-drowned it. Um, so we were going up across uh, Happy Valley, which is a beautiful valley near the coast in Wales. The views are absolutely fantastic. And it was scorching hot, it was boiling, boiling hot. We were all like roasting. And so there was just like this, a couple of puddles on the way. And I kind of should have realized that if there's a puddle on a day like that, it's probably going to be pretty deep because why else would there be water in, in, on the trail? So uh, I came around the corner and Clive was ahead of me and he'd gone through and he'd got his camera out. And also, telltale signs, guy gets his camera out next to a puddle, what do you think is going to happen? Um, but anyway, I went, I went through... And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got enough experience under my belt now to know not to just like gun it through a puddle that you don't know the depth. So I went quite slowly and the front end just dropped and there's obviously a massive kind of hole in the middle of this, this puddle. Uh, and so at that point I just stopped and was like, whoa, okay. Um, and to be honest, if I hadn't been filming it and messing around giving people cameras and stuff, I probably would have just pushed on and kept momentum and kept going. I think I probably would have been okay. But as it turns out, I didn't. So I, I, I managed to get over that little hump and then there was another one. So now my front wheel and my back wheel are in like holes in the ground. Um, and I hadn't realized it at the time, but the, the exhaust was actually submerged at the back of the bike. And you can see it, like the bubbles coming up. And I think if I'd kept the engine running, it would have been fine because the, you know, the exhaust vents coming out would have kept the water out of the exhaust to an extent. But I actually cut the engine because I wanted to chat to the guys and I didn't want to rush through it. And by cutting the engine, it meant that the water kind of came backed up along the, uh, through the exhaust pipe. Uh, fortunately, the water was not, I was probably about two inches, the, the, the header pipe was about two inches above the water, which meant that the water didn't go up and into the engine. 
so it wasn't a full drowning. So uh, I tried to start the bike again and it wouldn't start. Um, so I, you know, I've drowned bikes before, so I know you, you don't really want to push it. You push your lock at that point. So um, we used toe straps and we managed to drag the bike out of the side um, and we kind of got it upright. And all we had to do was we just put it up, let all the water come out of the exhaust. It's quite a lot in there dropped it and then kind of fingers crossed and managed to start it. Started, I think, on the second button. Um, and then we just let it run and let the water kind of just fire itself out the back. And, and I checked the oil. I didn't, uh, I mean, I checked the oil through the, the oil glass window and it looked fine. It wasn't milky. So I was happy to kind of just keep going with that. And so it's something to think about really, is I've always thought on the PR7, the, the air intake is really high. And so it's actually, you, you want the air intake to be at the highest point of the bike so that it reduces the chances of, it, unlike the EXC, where the air intake is kind of below your bum, um, which is low, the, the PR7 has a really high air intake, which is fantastic, but the exhaust is low. The exhaust doesn't sit high, the exhaust sits low. So if I, the next time I hit deep water on that bike, I'm going to try and keep momentum and I'm definitely going to um, keep the, the engine running unless there's some catastrophe that means I have to cut it out because ideally the exhaust venting, the, the gases coming out of the exhaust will help prevent the water backing up in the future. So yeah, so it was no drama, uh, no problem. Um, the bike was absolutely fine. Um, so Will, uh, Will Linson, who was on the trip with us, he was on a 2021 KTM 690. And a lot of people uh, want to know how the PR7 compares to the 690. We did swap bikes for a little bit, not a huge amount of time. Um, I think, I think immediately Will was not that enamored with the PR7, but he's definitely still in the um, honeymoon phase of, of his 690. Um, this is the first trip he's done on it. Um, my experience of being on that 690 was it felt much more like my KTM 450. Um, they're probably a similar, the PR7 and the 690 are probably a similar weight, but when you're sat on the 690, it pushes you, you're, you're, first of all, you notice is that the seat is very hard on the 690, much, much harder than on the PR7. You also, naturally, the geometry of it, it puts you right up over the tank. Um, no, actually it's not a tank, but up over the handlebars. So your elbows are up, you're further forwards, um, and you're much further over the front end, which is kind of where you want to be if you're racing and you're doing Enduros. And, and the 690 is the 690 Enduro. Whether or not the engine comes from a road bike, the geometry of the bike is much more Enduro race-based. Um, and having spent a lot of time on an Enduro bike, I definitely felt like it was like putting on an old glove and like, oh, right, so this is how it wants me to ride. Um, whereas uh, when you get on the PR7, it, it's much more laid, well not much more, but it is more laid back. So I feel that the 690 is probably better described as like a heavy enduro bike, whereas the PR7 is probably better described as a lightweight adventure bike. Um, so on the PR7, A, the seat is a million times comfier. It's, it's so much comfier. Also, you're, you're, just, you're just a little bit further away from the handlebars. You sit further back, um, I'm short, 6'7", 6'8", let's say 6'8", um, and uh, the foot pegs are fine for me, but I think taller people feel that they're quite cramped. Um, the position of them as well is slightly different to what you would have on an enduro bike. Um, I think they probably are closer to a more comfortable position for kind of road riding. Um, than automatically in the right place for stood up kind of hard technical riding. So yeah, um, I need to spend more time on a 690 to give you a real full lowdown on that, but that's my experience of it, um, is that the 690 felt like it was probably, I'd probably be more comfortable on the 690 doing harder, trickier um, trails, uh, and I would be more comfortable on the PR7 doing longer adventure riding. They'll both do both. It's like, where do you want to make your compromise? Do you want to be, do you want your compromise? Are you going to do more um, of the adventure riding 
and less technical stuff or make your compromise on the technical stuff, that's the PR7. Are you going to be doing more technical stuff and less road stuff? Like I think on the 690, you're going to be compromising on the, the road stuff and not compromising so much on the, the technical stuff. So, you know, the hunt for the unicorn continues. Um, between those two bikes, that's just how I see it and where you want to make your compromise. I'm pretty happy with um, the PR7, basically because I've got a 450 EXE in the garage and if I want to ride hard, I can just ride that. Um, and at the moment, that's not really the kind of riding I'm doing. Um, the other kind of bike worth mentioning is like Knowles. Well, there's the other, there are, so Davey had a, an older 690, so you know we've covered the 690. Um, Adam had a, a, a BMW G310 GS, which, I mean, he can ride. And that bike, I mean, I love that bike. It's low, it's, uh, you can get your feet down, and, the, and Adam proves that it can be ridden amazingly well. And there was so many bits where, you know, he was on a small, lightweight bike, a, 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 whatever, 300cc bike, and he was just flinging it around, and he looked like he was having a whale of a time. When you ride it yourself, you realize that it's actually quite flat, and to be riding it how Adam is riding it, you'll basically got to be, like, gunning it. You know, you're probably, you know, at the rev limiter a lot riding that bike. Um, but if you're prepared to ride it like that, ride it like you stole it, I think that's an awesome bike. Um, and then uh, Clive had his KTM 400 uh, EXC, which was pretty much the butt of the joke of the film. Um, and Noel was on a CRF 250 Rally uh, 2017 model. And that's kind of the dark horse, really. Like, I've always said that that bike is a, it's like a Dakar bike. No, it's a don donkey bike dressed as a Dakar bike. But honestly, for someone like Noel, like, it, it went everywhere. It didn't slow anyone down, it didn't break, it didn't drown, it did everything, it looked like he was having fun. It's just, well, as he said in the film, it's like no one's talking about it, it's like it wasn't there. Maybe that's what you want out of a bike. It's the sensible choice. Um, and maybe I should give it a go. Um, you know, my experience with the 250Ls, and I haven't actually ridden a rally, but the 250Ls are, Again, they're quite, they're very tame, they're very flat. Last time I rode one, I was like, oh yeah, I would buy this for my wife. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way about my wife, but she doesn't ride a bike. So I kind of felt like it's quite a, it would be an easy bike for her to get to grips with. Um, yeah, I'm loath to say that it was the perfect bike though. <laughs> because no one noticed it and it was Noel's bike. And if I were to admit that it were the perfect bike, I wouldn't hear the end of it. So it's not the perfect bike. So, the, so I, the only thing that I've missed up here is, is the tyre pressures. So I was running high tyre pressures, uh, 30 PSI, and that was fine. I just really didn't want to get um, any, uh, any pinch punctures. Um, I was running um, uh, heavy duty, not ultra heavy duty, but heavy duty tubes uh, inside the Motors Rousey's and was running 30 PSI. Uh, and it was fine apart from maybe two lanes where I really should have dropped the pressures. Um, and one of them in particular, it was quite steep. Uh, I lost momentum, it started raining, and I really, really struggled, I really struggled. And that was partly down to my height, the bike being tall, which couldn't get momentum. When you're a short rider on a tall bike, you can't paddle. So you don't have this ability to just kind of like paddle, 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 and then get going. You've literally just got to get going from, from the offset, and that's a really hard thing to do. Um, and I was really regretting having high tire pressures for that one. But um, yeah, if I did it again, I would probably drop my pressures to kind of high, high 20s at least. Um, uh, in fact, yeah, I'll do that next time. And then just pump them up for if we've got long road sections to get home. Anyway, um, yeah, the PR7 is definitely getting a few more battle scars. Um, still, still doing it for me. Um, I'm glad I haven't sold the 450 EXC just purely for the grin factor. Um, so I don't think there's any plans to get rid of that yet. Um, we'll see how we go with PR7. Uh, I've got another trip, some guys coming up um, in about 
three weeks time and we're probably all going to swap bikes on there so it'll be a good chance for everyone to give their opinions on on different bikes i think we're going to have the same gang and um, so we'll have 690 we'll have um my 450 we'll have a 250 rally uh what else we're gonna have we're gonna have an hp2 a bmw hp2 um yeah uh, we'll see that'll be a fun one um anyway if you want to know more about the pr7 keep firing over questions i will do my best to answer them um, and if you're interested in the rest of the gear that i've been using on this trip follow the links um, thank you for subscribing because I know you've subscribed um, and if you haven't you know what to do and the other significant thing to bring joy to your life is the shoot and ride monthly email newsletter which is hints and tips about moto photography so subscribe to that follow the links um, and yeah thank you for your time I know your time is precious um, I really appreciate it see you soon Ba 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 ba.